So hello everyone, uh, I'm Nevena and I'm going to be giving a workshop on TNCs and their role in international affairs today. So I just want to say, I know that you're muted now, but like I would really like you to participate. So anytime you have questions or comments, please uh, do comment and interrupt me because um, I would also like to hear your opinion. Before I start, I would be having actually a short introduction for you. Uh, so, uh, before I start, I would just like to tell you that I'm going to answer uh, two main questions, and they are related to corporate activism that they see as a mixture between economy and politics. And the two main questions I'm going to be um, answering in this presentation and in this workshop are uh, how much power actually transnational, transnational corporations have nowadays and what is their role and influence in the field of international relations. So before we start, I want to share with you um, one video. Yes, we can see it. Okay, let's watch it. Okay. Corporate Raiders were the stars of Wall Street in the 1980s. The new generation of troublemakers for chief executives are activist investors. Activist shareholders targeted the largest number of companies ever in 2018, a record 226 companies faced activist campaigns. One way to imagine activists is as the populace of finance. These investors, usually hedge funds, build small stakes in a company where they believe the share price can perform better. In the name of shareholder democracy, they demand their voice for change be heard, or else. The activist toolkit for seeking these changes is diverse, but in general, they are looking to shake up a company to boost its stock price. That could mean pushing for divestment or demanding that it should explore a sale. If they don't get their way, they will seek to replace the chief executive, a board member, or even a majority of the board. The first approach between an activist and management is usually private, perhaps through a letter. If the company doesn't comply or respond adequately, the activists will look to take their demands public. And that is when things can get ugly. Measures taken might include media campaigns to discredit management or board members. Some of the masters of the activist universe are Paul Singer of Elliott Management, Jeff Ubbett of Value Act, Nelson Peltz of Triumph Partners, and Carl Icahn, originally a corporate raider. Each professes to have their own unique style. But either way, these strategies are proliferating. In 2018, activists deployed the most capital ever. The amount invested in targets reached a high of $65 million. With that money, they've won a record number of board seats in target companies. And the trend is not stopping. Activist investors have historically focused on mid-sized US companies. That's partly because they're the ones that are easier to target, with fewer tools to defend themselves. But large funds are increasingly going after bigger and bigger targets and expanding their reach to Europe and Asia. We should expect more and more audacious activist campaigns in the year to come, as the appetite for corporate change is far from winning. Okay. Um, so you, you're probably wondering now why I've showed you uh, this video. So you've been probably seeing in newspapers nowadays, um, these headings and headlines. As, as you can see, usually they are talking about corporate activation in the political sphere. So they are talking about, for example, we have now how Amazon and Google uh, reacted on certain uh, what rules and um, that uh, American authorities were implying. And later, I'm going to be showing you also a real case study, how the company is interfering in international affairs and domestic affairs and how actually the politics and economy became so intervened. Um, so uh, I'm going to start now with a short definition and with a history, how actually transnational corporations became uh, what they are nowadays. So how are they? they are defined as you can see like this is the bigger like large uh, the definition so it's uh, saying that tncs are uh, any enterprises that are under that undertakes foreign direct investments that own controls income gathering assets in more than one country uh, that are producing goods or services outside of their country of origin and uh, that are engaging in international production or simply you can only say that this is like a company that is 
um, controlled from one country and registered in one country, but has its services and operation in uh, more than one country. And what we're going to discuss today, Navina, is how these companies that go across their borders and go internationally, how do they affect world affairs and international relations, right? Uh, yes, yes, correctly. So Great. I'm so not that's what to... we mean by transitional companies, like those who transition uh, their borders, right? Uh, like yes, the trans across their transnational. Borders. Yes, across their Great. borders. So Great. they are becoming a part of the international system. And now I'm going to be um, explaining how they developed and um, yeah, what role they play in international politics. Great. So, uh, yes, uh, just briefly going through the history. So you have um, multinational corporations. Someone can say uh, in the 16th century, um, you probably heard of Fordham and Mason the famous uh, English tea uh, makers, they were established in uh, 18th century, for example. But like real co corporations that we are seeing nowadays, um, they developed in the late 20s, in 1970s, actually. But again, uh, I'm seeing they have also uh, some sort of like some sort of transnational corporations in uh, 19th century. Um, and mostly they've been uh, established because they've been searching for natural resources like uh, minerals, raw, uh, raw materials, food, and etc. And they were mostly uh, Western based companies like the US and Western Europe. And um, but there were just a few of them, like, let's say big companies, two or three, and they were controlling, they were having assets altogether, no more than a half a billion US dollars. Of course, it was like a monopolistic concentration. It was again state-centric world, and probably they've been controlled by states they they are registered at. Uh, then we are having a first world world war, and the whole economy was about um, weapon production, and it was not much happening around. Um, nothing after the after the uh, second world war when we are having like a new establishment of new international system. So you probably heard of Bretton Woods and the economic system that has been developed and monetary system that has been developed after the Second World War. And it has mostly been controlled by the US. So that's why the US companies were also having the best position in the market. Uh, but again, European uh, companies and uh, Japan based companies started investing in industrial uh, stocks. They started also investing capital in, in big transnational corporations. So they somehow started developing um, this private sector as well. Uh, as you can see the data here. Um, so now we are having instead of three to five companies, more than 300 companies with an assets more than uh, one um, billion US dollars. And again, and, um, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Nevena, to, to, to yeah. interrupt you. And that's how the, uh, based on the Bretton Woods economic system, is that uh, what's the uh, uh, international organization of, of trade is based on? Uh, the most of, of organization, like we are having international monetary fund in that time, were based on these principles established by Bretton Woods. Uh, so yes, exactly. in this period of time, international economic system, we can call it like that, was uh, following the principles of Bretton Woods. Because it, it later on, it, it, it was like uh, some kind of uh, an agreement to follow a certain system, and then it turned out into the international trade organization. Uh, yes, yes, that's correct. Okay, we would like to highlight how that affected growing countries or uh, uh, um, countries that are not as lucky as the U.S. later on. Yeah, <laughs> yeah definitely. I would be covering this in another part. Great. I'm um, sorry to interrupt you. I'm sorry. No, no, no. It's okay. It's okay. Ask my question. Okay. I'm so, inviting so you know everyone else if they have a question whenever they want. 
Yeah, so you guys just unmute and your mics and ask me whatever you want. So we are coming to this period of 1970s, late 1970s, uh, where uh, when this system we just mentioned, Bretton Woods, was actually over. So uh, the, com the international economy shifted more towards what we are having now, neoliberal capitalism. When we have um, open markets, and liberal markets and expansion of these um, transnational companies and investments abroad. So the main economic tool after, especially in this period, uh, became for indirect investments. So that's when uh, so one company is investing in another one. And they've been, um, as I asked me previously, they've been targeting um, developing world now because it was economically more beneficial for them. So the restrictions were lower and um, the, of course the labor was much cheaper and certain environmental standards as well were much lower than in the countries in the developed world. So that's why they became interested in spreading their capital and investing in developing world. Um, from another point of view, developing world and the new theories that developed uh, were uh, assuming that international and uh, actually foreign direct investments would boost your economy. So that's why it's good and profitable for you to be open and to attract companies because, of course, they would uh, open new job positions, you're going to hire new people, and they're going to boost the capital um, in, in your country and in your economy. So that's how it started spreading worldwide. And and uh, another contribution as well was the process of globalization. Uh, we have industrial and technological revolutions and innovations that enabled like production to be cheaper, uh, shipments to be much more um, affordable and much more feasible, and as well uh, advertisement, marketing, and all these parts of the, of the business process. So as you can see now, there are numbers and uh, now we have like more than many, many, many thousand companies, but like the biggest uh, top 100, uh, their assets were more than 3.4 trillion US dollars. Uh, late, later, I'm going to be showing you uh, comparing the revenues of the state and the revenues of the richest companies. Um, and uh, you're going to see how actually how, how much capital they have uh, concentrated in in, in, in their hands, actually. So uh, this is the, we, all, we already touched this framework and I'm gonna be talking more about this later. So this is about the, the framework, how the companies are regulated. So about the institutions, about uh, agreements, about rules they are operating and frameworks they are operating within, but I'm not gonna be talking now about it because um, there's a special chapter I would, um, I would talk later about. So now we are moving to the field of international affairs and uh, theories. So I don't know what, it, what you studied and I would like to hear later. So I don't know how much you're familiar with this, but I'm gonna start from scratch and um, explain the basic theories and where, where are uh, corporations inside of these political theories. So uh, orthodox higher theories, the oldest ones, uh, famous realism and liberalism. Uh, so they are saying that the states are main actors in international relations. So you might be having some other actors operating, but they are not significant and they don't have as much power as, as state have, states have. Uh, so that means that they are bringing regulations, they are bringing rules, and they're acting as they want. So corporations might, ha might have some influence, but again, they are controlled by states and they cannot do much. Um, later, we have uh, developing uh, like these middle ground theories that are saying, okay, yeah, that's true, state matters. Um, states, uh, they matter a lot and they have a lot of power, but again, international system is not only composed by states so you have a system like a structure and you have like an agents and agents are actually actors 
and they can be states, they can be international corporations, non-governmental organizations, international organizations, they all matter and they are all interacting and changing uh, this system, this international system. So they are giving some sort of uh, significance to, um, to private actors and to corporations as well. And now moving to the theories that are uh, in particular about transnational corporations. So there are two approaches. And one theoretical approach is saying, um, it's very familiar to the orthodox IR theories. And they're saying like, um, from state-centric point of view, as you can see on the left part here, the first theory. Um, so they are saying, uh, okay, maybe it's true, the states, they changed. They are not independent as they used to be in past, but again, they are main players. And they admit uh, they are another actors, they are corporations that are having a significant role. But again, that's not as important as states. And they are saying, yeah, private capital and private corporations, transnational corporations, they matter, but they are doing actually, um, they are just extended uh, hand of national interest. So they're going to be doing what country says. They don't have much of, um, how to say, uh, they're not independent. They don't have much they, of- they, they don't have much uh, options or much freedom to act because, but, yes. but why are As they, they controlled by the state? Uh, uh, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> you got, uh, yeah, lost they're, they're a little saying, bit here. No, uh, they are saying, uh, I mean, this is the, just, the, I'm just saying like the main features of the concept and the theory, of course, is much larger. So practically they are saying if the, for example, I'm the US and my companies are going to work, um, they are registered in my system. And when they go abroad and deploy capital somewhere abroad, uh, they promote my interest because they are bringing again money in my country. And um Exactly. Yeah, they're not going to be. That's what I wanted you to elaborate yeah. for everyone else. Thank you, um, Thank you. Yeah, you're very welcome. Actually, I've told that I would be working with one person, so that's why I developed a case study for him to investigate on US and Huawei and what happened there. And it's very interesting to see how actually sometimes state can Nina, be controlled. You can, you um, can, you can. Uh, your subscribers are Halloweeni, Basant, and Maria. You can give them the uh, okay. whatever activities you want. Maria, Hello, are you here? Yes, doctor. Okay, Maria is your subscriber. Me too, Nivina. I've got everyone else like your subscribers. Please do with us whatever you planned for the subscriber. We are mm -hmm. your subscribers. Okay, Don't worry, actually, we're going to pay equally. More interesting. <laughs> yeah, I have much more interesting thing for you. Uh, I a game but let's like talk okay. about it okay again. we're sorry for interrupting um, yeah, no, we're here for no, you no, no. no worries um so there is another framework now totally opposite from this one that i mentioned uh that is called transnational capitalism so they're saying the corporations became so big and uh, so rich and so important that they developed a new system a new economic system that is completely independent from the states they developed um, institutions in this system, and the members of these institutions are uh, economic elites, and they are making decisions for themselves. They are bringing up rules, decisions, actions, and state can't do much about it. Um, they are saying this is a new order uh, that is developed, and this is not the old world anymore, and the corporations, the, the biggest power in the international affairs is con concentrated uh, in the hands of uh, transnational corporations. And they are saying they're they are much, much powerful in states and they're having also a control over them. Uh, so as usual, the, and the truth is somewhere in between, right? And um, their authors, Babich, Fichner and Hemskirk, that try to develop more realistic approach. And if you ask me, that's just a combination between these two theories. So I'm gonna tell you what they are saying quickly. So they are practically explaining that um, it's true that international system is changing, changing economic system uh, changed and actors as well changed. 
but uh, neither phenomena in IR is determined by one actor. So it's always a mixture and it's always a few actors interacting and having this mutual dependency between them. And that's how the phenomena and the outcome is created. So uh, they are starting from the state power and they are saying again, this is um, from the realistic perspective, this is um, race for power and uh, each actor is trying to be powerful. They're trying to um, fight for their interest and try to gain the hegemony. Um, and the states are still dominating in, in this system. But again, they are not the only significant and important actors. There are transnational corporations and many other actors, and the outcome depends on their mutual um, interaction. So sometimes their interests might meet, sometimes they might cooperate, sometimes they might fight uh, and compete. And, and it all depends uh, from the situation. And that's how it should be analyzed from the situation, from the specific case. And that's how you can make a conclusion. So you cannot predetermine who is more powerful because this power is um, dispersed between them. And it's changing all the time. So their relationship is very like uh, multidimensional. Um, so I, I mentioned you previously that I will show you uh, the revenues of the state and the revenues of the corporations. So you can see who is richer. And there is something called the CAE World Factbook. And this is a report of the revenues. So these are the measurements. You can take a look just quickly um, how the measurements, what measurements they used and what are the outcomes and findings. So they use the revenues of the states, mainly collected uh, from taxes, but uh, GDP was not included, and the revenues of the companies, and they compared it. So the findings were like, like very interesting because top 100, the most rich and uh, the, the richest uh, entities are like mixture between states and companies, but 71 of them are corporations. And, um, but again, the first top five, and you see the 27 companies are coming from the uh, richest country in the world, which is US. And the second one is China, that is slowly rising. And there are 14 companies from China in the top richest um, revenue generators. So you can take a look here and see. So the richest one, United States, China, Japan, Germany, France, United Kingdom. And then goes Italy, Brazil. I'm not quite sure how Brazil ended up here. But again, um, we should look into the measurements and, and see. Of course, don't take this for granted. This is just you know, like one of the reports. You might find some others. Um, and then you have a Walmart as what's, one. Of, what's of the source of this report, report please, Navina? Uh, yeah, this is a CAE framework, uh, a CAE World Factbook, actually. Okay. And it is from 2017. I've been recently checking the richest companies in the world, like from this year report. So you can take a look also on different reports, but I couldn't find this is the, the, the most updated one uh, that compares. Um, uh, countries and, and companies. So yeah, as you can see, this is just the first 30s because I, I, I couldn't put all the 100. But again, if you're interested, I can just send your report and you can take a look. Uh, also something to bear in mind here, there are corporations and uh, companies that are super rich and super big. And some of them, like for example, China, National Petro Petroleum, um, they are on this list, but I'm not quite sure if we can see them as a transnational corporations because it's a specific, um, a different type of company that is state controlled. Uh, I didn't cover this topic in this uh, workshop because um, I think that they didn't have like a space, but if someone is interested, we can talk later about it. So those are the companies that are state controlled and the most, uh, like the biggest number of companies uh, that are state controlled are coming from Russia and from China, because you know, they're 
different, how they called it, state capitalism, different economic system that they have. And they are one of the richest, th those companies are one of the richest companies in the world. Um, so yeah, so let's move. I've told you about the frameworks. So these are the basic frameworks, how transnational corporations are regulated. So the basic one and the most important, I would say, is the, the famous code, uh, the UN Code of Conduct on Transnational Corporations. And they are uh, covering the standards of cooperational behavior in country. They are social, economic, political, legal issues are covered by the code. And uh, we again have uh, MIGA, you probably heard of it, is under the World Bank. Um, like a special organization that is um, for investments, but investments um, that are like uh, non-commercial risks. For example, if one country is investing in a developing country and they just want to help but not gain uh, like a profit, so they rule their uh, rights should be protected by a special um, framework and MIGA is actually doing that. We again have GATT, you probably, G-A-T-T, you probably heard of it, the General Agreement on Traffic, uh, on Tariffs and Trade, that is in specific regulating uh, tariffs and trade, as it's saying. Uh, we have another framework for sustainable, and sustainable goals uh, are set by the UN and um, companies were asked to meet those criteria and to participate. And what I actually wanted to tell you, if you, if you look the headings of main newspapers, economists on New York Times, the companies, they are, uh, their activism is mostly in this sector, in environmental sector, in, in development and especially sustainable development, because um, you can investigate more on this issue uh, they started being engaged in this area more than states, more than international organizations. So they started taking the lead and stepping up the game. And it's very interesting to see. Um, again, I'm showing you this framework to see how uh, states and corporations, their, their powers, they're again so mixed. So this is the framework that regulates a specific area for companies, but again, it's developed by international organizations. And uh, who are the members of international organizations? They are states, right? So again, you can see this, these dynamics of relations that I have. And all these regulations are based on the recognition of the sovereignty of the state. So if the company comes and uh, invests in certain state, there is a framework and these criteria. But I have to say, um, this is applying only if state allows, and I'm respecting its sovereignty, and it's going to be like, I'm going to respecting the legal system of that state as well. Um, the most efforts for regulating this environment came from the Western states, because this is this system, this international system was developed by them. Um, and of course, it benefits them the most. Um, and yes, I want to tell you just to take a look and think about this. And you can see that uh, TNC is so recognized as a power, powerful actors in international arena, and especially in mobilizing resources, economic resources, and deploying this capital in another in another countries. Uh, they are the most uh, the, the the biggest force um, in economic and social development because they hold the capital. And um, yeah, this consequently enhances the need of strength, strengthening international cooperation of this matter because both uh, the corporations and the states and the nations and the societies can benefit if this area is regulated and everyone knows what are their rules and what are their obligations. And now you're asking like, if they have so much economic power, do they have these uh, public roles? I've mentioned you their activism and it started being um, so famous and popular for, from 2018. And you saw why? Because the main uh, board, the, the main members of the board became activists, people that have a lot of money, but again, have certain values 
like a value system they want to follow in this economic area. And they started using their business and their brands for certain political actions, for certain social actions, for environment, and etc. And uh, there is uh, there is actually um, uh, a theory developed by Rondinelli that is saying with more power there are more responsibilities coming. So the companies should be having a public role and they should be engaged in three specific issues: in social issues, um, in uh, social um, inequality, for example. Um, in a political process and in human rights. But again, all of these areas are on voluntarily basis. Company are not obliged to do so. So it is only if they want to engage and to speak up and to take actions. And now uh, we're gonna go to the case study. And this one is very interesting for me because for actual, it's about the current Israeli and Palestinian conflict and actually Israeli policies toward uh, Palestinians. And you probably heard of BDS. If you haven't, you probably read about Ben and Jerry's and their withdrawal from the Israeli market. So before I start about uh, BDS and what it stands for and about this specific case study of uh, Ben and Jerry's, uh, does anyone have maybe any question? We're so eager to, to hear about the PDS and, and this case study. Go ahead. Okay. Anyone has a question, guys? OK. OK, I assume not. <laughs> OK, this is the more interesting part of the presentation, I got to say, because this was mostly historic and, historical and theoretical. But I want to give you like some sort of sense and um, concepts so you can see how they are regulated and how they operate in this system nowadays. Uh, so specifically about the BDS, um, it is a movement that was um, initiated in 2005. And it stays, uh, stands for boycott, uh, divestments, and sanctions against Israel. And those, all of these measures are uh, private economic measures. And uh, they ask for differentiation between Israeli and Israeli settlements, um, especially areas of West Bank, East Jerusalem, and Golan Heights. Um, I'm going to be explaining more about this in, a, in the next uh, section, but there is also reaction to BDS, and it's a very important one. Um, it's called anti-BDS, and it stands for like anti-differentiation anti efforts, which means like um, efforts for not differentiating between Israeli, Israel and Israeli settlements. And these efforts took place not only in Israel, but in the US, and uh, I would be uh, talking about it also later. So anti-BDS includes uh, legislative considerations um, from anti-boycott law, and they also touch, touch some uh, issues related to American First Amendment. And how far this can go, you will see in, in this case study. So as I mentioned, the background for the BDS, um, a group of actors from different countries, uh, they started advocating for- Excuse me, Navina, uh, what does BDS stand for again? Uh, boycott, divestment, uh, and um, just a moment, and uh, sanctions. Okay. And it's all of these- because I'm live. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, so those are mostly economic measures. Um, so uh, they, BDS, who supports them, is actually a group, group of actors uh, from different countries who advocate measures against Israel, economic measures against Israel, and its policies against Palestinians. Uh, so the main reason why this movement was uh, established and initiated was to support Palestinians um, to support their cause, and uh, they were aiming on three main um, objectives. So they want uh, ending of Israeli occupation of all these disputable territories. They are asking for um, recognition of fundamental rights for Arab Palestinian citizens of Israel, 
and they want uh, respect, protection and promotion of the rights of Palestinian refugees to return to their homes and properties. Of course, as you can see, it's so ambitious and you're probably wondering if, if it's possible to be um, reached. Um, but again, uh, it's a strong initiative and I would show you now who are uh, the participants here. Um, just a moment. Okay. I want, before I start uh, with uh, Ben and Jerry's case, I've talked about anti-BDS reaction. And, and I want you to know about it because you can see uh, how powerful this social movement can be. It has, uh, so, so who are the participants? Mostly non-governmental organizations, um, public, uh, I don't know, some famous people, they can be also participating in BDS, uh, private companies, and yet we don't have like um, states and international organization participating um, directly in it, but some of uh, European Union phones, for example, they also took stand on BDS. So they stopped investing in the um, Israeli um, settlements because of this movement. So, so this is some sort of indirect, they never say directly and openly, they did that as a part of the BDS movement, but indirectly everyone knows about that. Um, so how the Israeli re responded to this, it's really a serious measure. And Israeli and US officials, uh, they opposed public, pub, publicly, of course, and denounced all punitive economic measures against Israel. Against Israel. Israel has developed a strategy of strengthening relations with their current partners. So instead of some companies and some actors were boycotting them, but again, they are for, a, for indirect investments. For example, they tripled in the from 2005 when the movement was established to 2016 because they really took it seriously and they developed like even stronger partnerships with their partners. Um, so Israel is having a Minister of Strategic Affairs that every year is having a budget of $26 million to counter BDS activities. And this involves like a digital strategy where they go and speak and make videos and make campaigns. Um, this involves lobbying, especially in the US. This involves engaging with uh, powerful people from their diaspora to take action of these measures. <laughs> And um, it's interesting, uh, they also took legal actions. So uh, they passed the Israeli parliament in 2017, passed a law that allows their government to block the entrance of non-residents that openly call and support the boycott. <clears throat> and again, um, it's interesting to see this example of Soda Stream that is Israeli company and in 2015, they closed their factories in West Bank and they uh, fired all the Palestinian workers because they moved their factory to Israel and uh, Palestinian people, they couldn't uh, obtain a new license for a permit to work in a new location. So you might be wondering, is BDS effective? And actually, does it make more harm, does it bring more harm than good? to Palestinian people. Um, how far this initiative can go, you can see on this example that not only you that not only Israel reacted, reacted, but also the US, and the action was really serious. A number of lawmakers and policymakers, they didn't just go public and say this is not okay and you cannot do that, but actually they enacted law. And uh, they take it, they, they took legal actions against the BDS. So their aim was to deter participants um, in BDS related activities and economic differentiation between Israeli and Israel and Israeli settlements. Um, and it's interesting to see this boycott is not BDS is from 2005, a movement. But again, the boycott, it started um, before the Israel was established as, as a country, and especially took place in 1970s when the Arab League started the boycott and uh, against Israel. So none of the Arab states and Arab nations 
um, traded with, with Israel. And as a response to this policy and to this decision, U.S. developed um, a federal law on the federal basis in 1970s, in late 1970s, that, uh, that banned U.S. companies from participating in any foreign boycott of any country. And there are certain uh, civil and criminal penalties if they find that you are doing that as a company. Uh, from 2015, they started developing, uh, they started enacting a new law, and uh, it was not on the federal basis, it was on a state basis. So, legislation, a number of US states proposed or enacted anti BDS legislation. Currently, 35 states are having this, um, this type of legislation. Uh, and there are two broad categories of this enacted legislation. So, it's investment focus that requires states uh, of the US to avoid investing in companies that are engaging or only advocating economic measures against, against Israel. And there is another type of legislation which is contracting focused. They don't want to have any kind of contracts, any kind of contracts buying or selling products from the companies and businesses uh, that are engaging or advocating um, economic measures against Israel. So this became a very big issue, and uh, there are two parts. <laughs> so one was uh, one group was supporting and saying like this is completely aligned with uh, what U.S. is promoting, like a free trade, certain values, and certain principles. But there is another group of people that is saying this is completely unacceptable and it touches potential First Amendment issues uh, in a sense that there is a free speech and you can say and you can criticize any action you want. So this case um, was filed to Supreme Court and Supreme Court uh, said it was his opinion that um, you can boycott and you can do and you can take any actions and measures if it is about uh, standing for certain political cause, for certain uh, social issue, et cetera, et cetera. So that is protected by freedom of speech and you can do whatever you want and government cannot forbid you uh, and stop you from, from doing that. But like if they see that you're doing this because of taking economic advantage, um, then, then you might be held responsible and maybe some certain penalties might apply to you. Uh, so again, this is very broad. And if it takes like certain legal measures, again, the US companies that is engaged against Israel and boycotting uh, economic, um, economically boycotting Israel is probably gonna be like from case to case to decide. But let's see what Ben and Jerry's did recently in, in Israel. Um, so, as I've told you, corporate activism is taking, stepping up the game, and this is what former uh, CEO of Unilevers, and Unilevers is the company, a parent company of the Ben & Jerry's, so which means they are controlling them entirely. They bought them in 2020, and now Ben & Jerry's, the company is controlled by Unilever. Um, and their former CEO, uh, Paul Pullman said CEOs have to step up uh, to de-risk the political process, which means they have to step up their game and starting really influencing and participating in social issues, political issues, environmental issues. Um, so what actually happened with Ben & Jerry's in uh, Israel, uh, they didn't want to withdraw their products uh, from the entire country. They just asked them because the company was present there for 30 years. And they asked the Israeli licensee, the company that was buying a license from Ben & Jerry's to sell uh, their ice cream in Israel. They asked them to stop selling the products in Israeli settlements, which of course they refused because they were telling, no, there are no Israeli settlements. There's just one country, the country of Israel. And we cannot differentiate between these. This is against our law. And then they say, okay, if it's this way, we are canceling entire brand and entire selling in your country. So th this was really a boom and it really exploded as you can see on social media and everyone was talking about that. And uh, Ben & Jerry's officials came and said, we believe it is inconsistent with our values 
for Ben and Jerry's ice cream to be sold in the occupied Palestinian territory. So seeing this really has big repercussions because you as a business uh, entity, you're just taking care of profits, right? You don't take care of what is going on in certain country. You're not interfering in certain like internal affairs. But no, companies started doing that. And uh, we're going to see what's the reason for that now. Um, so someone would say, OK, maybe they were doing that for marketing purposes because it started being so popular uh, to, um, to promote certain values. But the company has more than 30 years of, of the history, how they support and uh, how they're engaged in political processes, social processes, how they were supporting financial reform, criminal justice record, water registration, or climate, ju climate just, um, justice. Uh, so I want to show you something about Ben & Jerry's. It's again a very short video, but I want you to see who established the company and how from the very beginning their founders were um, participating in, in these um, political issues. So let me just again use this technology and share. The ice cream company, best known for its decadent pints, has steadily been gathering right ingredients, not just for its yummy ice cream but also for the amplification of social justice causes as well. For its social media channels and website, the company has called on defunding the police, ending the school to prison pipeline, and encouraging voting by mail. Oftentimes, these campaigns will result in something you see in the frozen food aisle. Justice Remix supports criminal justice reform, save our world, raises awareness on climate change, and I do I do celebrated the Supreme Court's decision to legalize gay marriage. This summer's nationwide protests over racial injustice, corporate America has scrambled to respond cohesively. Many have stumbled. The NFL, posting in support of Black Lives Matter while also parting ways with Colin Kaepernick for peacefully protesting, was criticized as hypocritical. And L'Oreal received a similar reaction because it had fired a Black trans model who had spoken up in the past. According to a recent survey, two-thirds of Generation Z consumers say corporate and brand reactions to Black Lives Matter will permanently affect their purchasing habits. Getting it right matters. It's one of the reasons why Ben & Jerry's approach stands out so much. The company has long spoken out on issues since founders Ben Cohen and Jared Greenfield started the Creamery in 1978. In 2000, the hippie brand was acquired by consumer product giant Unilever, but that hasn't slowed its activism. It's even inspired other Unilever brands like Dove Soap to do the same. Like me. Being vocal on liberal causes has so far neither hurt nor helped the brand. Each year, the Ben & Jerry's Foundation earmarks $2.5 million for grassroots causes. But Ben & Jerry's has shortcomings of its own where inclusion is concerned. While the board's seven directors includes four women and three people of color, the majority of Ben & Jerry's workforce is white. This in part reflects the state it operates in. Vermont is about 94% white, so the company is looking for other ways to become more diverse. Another issue is with this deeply unhealthy product, which we've seen clashing with the support of Black Americans who are more likely to contract type 2 diabetes than white people. According to former CEO Yostin Solheim, the company isn't based, saying, if we share values on climate, same-sex marriage, racism, I think that's a deeper bond than sugar and fat. Yeah, so as you can see, that um, they have like a long history of just go back to of being socially engaged and politically engaged in different uh, issues. Um, you saw uh, at the beginning, I've told you about the stakeholders, right? I've showed you this video. And you see who are the stakeholders here and who are the main participants of their board. So it's like women and people of color. And you see how that also affects um, their decision making and what stance gonna, they're going to take and what decision they're going to make when dealing with certain political issues. And it's also interesting that this company uh, has like a seniority, one of the most important role within the, co the company is like the head of global activism strategy. So they don't do it just like out of blue when reacting to certain um, issue. 
in international affairs that is of social or political nature, but actually they have a developed strategy for that. So they know when they're going to stand for it. Um, again, what are the consequences for this? I've told you they said it's, that they're not going to be uh, doing their business because it's against their value to, to cooperate with occupied Palestinian territory, with Israeli actually. And that had a lot of repercussions and consequences for them. Uh, so company was... Um, they, they, they've been accused uh, for the new sort of terrorism. Uh, Naftali Bennett, Israeli new prime minister, said that. Uh, they've been accused for the anti-Semitism again. But it's not only that. It's also uh, the legal problems that the company might have in the US. And I mentioned you this anti-boycott, uh, anti-BDS legislation. So it's going on now in... Uh, 35 countries in the US. And this company, Ben & Jerry, is, belongs to Unilever. And Unilever is US-based US company. So this also might cause certain uh, tensions between these two partners, right? Uh, because the company, Unilever, that owns Ben & Jerry is called responsible for this. And this section was taken by Ben and Jerry's independently. They said, like, we have our own board and we're going to make this section. Um, but again, it's going to affect their parent company. So it caused the big, big issues for them. Uh, again, I've told you that legislation uh, says um, all the public entities, all the funds, for example, pension funds, um, wouldn't be uh, continue their contracts or it, they wouldn't invest in the companies that are supporting a boycott ag again against Israel. So now the pensions fun funds will be bared from investing in Unilever. Um, government entities will be bared from buying goods and services from Unilever. And they have like a variety of brands like Dove, for example, is also theirs. So it's going to have a huge repercussion for their profits too. But why did the company do this? This is purpose-driven corporate uh, activism. So they have certain purpose that they are following. And uh, this is, first of all, moral action. It's not like profit cost based thing, and they were not looking for profits, probably. But this is a moral action that uh, contributes to the global movement, that promotes social and, and racial equality. So backing up the Palestinians is saying uh, all the international community and all the big powers <clears throat> sees Israeli actions as normal. This is not normal. And uh, someone sh should stand up and say this is not normal and this is not legal. And um, that's bring a change. So now in this moment, uh, this is a private actor. They are not political actors. And they cannot bring the, the political solution, right? But again, when you think in the long term, they might bring a change because they might um, build enough of capacity and pressure and um, that would actually uh, bring a change later on. Because you know about the apartheid in South Africa, it's something similar happened. So there was economic boycott of their authorities for 30 years and it brought change at the end, right? Um, so this would be pretty much it about our case study and uh, presentation. If you want to read more about this, I would recommend you an uh, amazing article from Nesrin Malik in Guardian about specifically about Ben & Jerry's case. So you can guys uh, take a look on it. Um, the next case I also wanted to show you is like Huawei and the US and how actually there is a big game between politics and economy, especially in this case, maybe one of the most interesting ones. But again, I won't be bothering you to research on it now. These are the questions that I wanted to be um, answered and to give you like 15 minutes to research about it and make a presentation, but um, let's not do that now. I wanted you maybe um, now to, to ask me certain questions if you have, or maybe we can play a game. I don't know if you heard of Kahoot, but we can go and play a game. I would, I would develop the quiz 
And yeah, let's see who's gonna win. Do you have any questions for the beginning? No questions? Okay. Um, so can you unmute your mics? Because I want to ask you about the Kahoot. Uh, you're going to need to download it. Okay. Please, where is everyone else? Why doesn't anyone question Nivena or do you have any... Uh, Maria is saying that it's a very organized and structural presentation. Maybe that's why they don't have a question. But okay. uh, where is everyone else? I have a question. This, uh, is my voice clear? Yes, uh, yeah, now it I is. Can hear you now. Yeah, Lavin, ask. Hello, Dr. Navina, right? Is uh, no, no, I'm not Dr. Navina. <laughs> you can call Nicola? me just Navina. Okay, so uh, is my voice clear? Yeah. Uh, yes. You hear me? Okay. So I understand that the state and the. Sorry. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can hear you. Oh, it's my cat, sorry. So yeah. they, they are centric to the operation of the economy. They have to be both interchangeably operating or some kind of coordination to be present. To to find what's what's beneficial to the economy because they are driven by different motives. I understand this. Recently, it's been um, the information era. This is obvious. Um, corporates uh, are exposed to a huge amount of data, big data. Yeah. Um, th this, is, this is a kind of leverage. But how, how do we monitor the purpose-driven activism, the corporate activism? Uh, how do we want? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Uh, how, is who, the question who, clear enough to you, Navina? Uh, yeah, yes, yeah, sort of. Just so, like, who who are we? Like, we are as a citizens or uh, non corporate activists? <laughs> Please non -corporate. rephrase your question, Halloween. Yeah, how Nivina. how to make sure? How to make sure that in the future, uh, corporates will be motivated by the social. Um, beneficial outcomes. Mm -hmm. Well, we, we cannot be sure that they are motivated by this. And as so in this video, for example, when they've been criticizing L'Oreal for a certain like uh, purpose-driven action, and then they fired uh, people that are part of the minorities, right? And companies so are all great. are only the facts. I'm sorry, Nivina, to interrupt you, but uh, uh, let me give you my input and then you can uh, uh, analyze it. Of what I see, that uh, companies are only interested in, in in social activism when it takes off their taxes. Is that the ugly truth, or there is much uh, more into it? No, no. There is like they can be just interested as in this case that we learned, uh, Ben and Jerry's. They can be interested just like that because they are supporting this issue and this cause. Exactly, but on what basis a but company it's rare chooses to see. a certain a certain social uh, issue to support or not? Uh, well, it's based, uh, as I told you and show at the beginning, uh, who is the stakeholder and who is having like the main word. For example, if you are a stakeholder in like Coca Cola, you've been probably supporting something that you value, right? Yes. That is something that is important to you. So it depends on the stakeholder. And also there are some other strategies. They always take a look what's the popular. So if they're targeting this Z, Z generation and they see that they support Black, uh, Black Lives Matter. So they're gonna go maybe because of the marketing thing to support this cause. So they can be, their motivation can be different and you can never know what's actually behind that. Sure. Okay, back to Halawani's uh, question. Is it uh, clear to you, Navina, or do you need him to rephrase it? Uh, yeah, if I understood it, how we can know uh, that they support something or they, they go for something. We can never know actually what's behind their decision. It, so... it depends on the events as well. Like you mentioned now, Black Lives Matters. Uh, um, it depends what topic is on the 
top uh, uh, um, uh, priority list to the society and they use that topic in terms of marketing am i right Oh uh, yeah, yeah, that is and, true. And increasing their sales, it's, it's 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 as well as the LGBT community. Many companies go supporting the LGBT community when 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 they have right before uh, the the march of Pride or right before uh, um or uh, right after a social event takes place, like certain violence against gays or certain. It's all matter of raising our strategies to raise sales and, and, and market themselves better is that th there always has to be an interest behind companies uh, supporting social activities. Uh, in most of the cases, you have to analyze that. And I guess that we don't have data on it because it's a you know, like very, very secure decision and private decision. But I would say definitely they look into miss. I mean, this is the main driver for the companies to make a profit and market themselves. But again, you are having a companies like in this case that just decided it's going to have like real repercussions, repercussions and they're going to suffer a lot because of this decision. But again, they decided just to stand for moral cause because they've told it's enough and someone should. And this actually, and this actually, Nivina makes the companies more of an actor in 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 societies. It's enough, and we should boycott. Uh, okay. Oh uh, uh, yeah, definitely, and especially uh, from. Uh, I'm sorry, your, three your years voice was incident. cutting off. Please repeat that again. I'm sorry, your voice was cutting off. Uh, yeah, definitely. I would say they are becoming uh, more and more important important actors here. Uh, and especially in last three years. So is it more and like a vicious the circle? Shift in economy, right? uh, yes, honey. Is it more like a vicious circle, Nivina, like uh, 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 societal movements uh, moves companies into supporting social certain social activities according to the priority of the people, and then these companies adopting these social uh, 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 movements or activities or inclinations and uh, then yeah, become a point. promoter for it, right? Yeah, yeah, that's a very good point because we know that usually it comes from non-governmental organizations, right? And organizations, and then the companies support them, which is, I think, um, such a powerful um, cooperation because the company has a brand and money and influence. And the so market really strategies, feel, of course. Yeah, when they cut, yeah. So you can feel when they cut their economic investment. And it's very good when they cooperate with people with values and purposes. So I would definitely say that, yeah, they are the drivers. Social movements are the drivers, obviously, for these right. social cause and political issues. Okay. Anyone else has any question? Maria, Silvia, Halloweni. Anyone has a question? Okay, please proceed, okay. Navina. Thank you very much. Thank you for uh, letting uh, us interrupt you. <laughs> no, you're anytime. Um, so thank you for the questions. Um, I will have 10 more questions for you on this game called Kahoot. And believe me, it's very interesting. I don't know if you had, if you played it before. No. Uh, so you I guys need to download it. Okay, where, where should we download so, it from? Could, could you share the screen with us, please? Or uh, show us? Yeah, uh, yeah. I can only share a screen of the game, but you have to download it first um, on just on Google. Just write it like this: Kahoot app. Okay, on PC so, or on mobile? Is it an app? Okay, on mobile. Oh, uh, wherever you want. Like, what's easier for you? You can go on mobile. Uh, I know when I was playing it as a student, I was on my mobile because it's easier. But now I have to share a screen with you and. Um, I, I will download yeah. it on the mobile till you share the screen and show us more. Okay. Everyone, uh, download Kahoot, K-A-H-O-O-T, play and create quizzes. It's an app for students. Yeah. What does it do, honey? Tell us more. Uh, you can just download it. And I already made a quiz, a game. Uh, so I will ask a question and you're going to have a few answers. And you gotta pick the right one. And uh, who has like 
the most right answers gonna win the game. <laughs> okay, yalla, I hope I'll be the one. Yalla, everyone has Kahoot on their mobile. Gonna say that. <laughs> what is the pin? What okay. pin? What pin? Please unmute uh, yourselves, everyone. What is the pin? Uh, I'm gonna yeah. sh send you the game now and I'm gonna tell you the pin. Wait, yeah. just can a moment. Can pin? we play this one, the online one? Can we yes. play it? Well, uh, well uh, do we have to download the application? Uh, you, you just have to download the app. So I will share with you link now of... Okay, I downloaded sure. the app. Okay, perfect. Uh, I'm sending you... Try to access this. We don't see anything on the screen yet, okay. Uh, did you get it now? On the screen? No, not yet. Mm -hmm. uh, on chat? On chat, okay. Um, um, so. Okay, so I have to open this one. Uh, it's well. not a uh, pen that's uh, to create a uh, Kahoot or what? Yeah, that's like. Oh, fit team would go. For... Uh, I'm playing as a guest. Yeah, as a guest. So let's see. It's waiting for teams to swim. TNC's game. Okay, which one? Player versus one player, one one device, or team mode? Team versus team. Which uh, one should play? Play? It should be team with team. Okay. Let me see. Oh, okay. okay. Uh, did I ask you for? Loading game pin. Uh, oh, I'm here. Three three zero zero. Three three zero. What are TNCs? I have the questions, I guys. If you, if you open, if you just open uh -huh. the link, Navina just sent. Yes. Okay. It will just show you the questions. Quiz, what are NTCs? According yeah, to you, you, if you just go down, if you just go down, okay, on the same link that Navina just sent, okay, forget okay. play as a guest and sign up. You'll just find the questions. There are 10 questions, right, Navina? Uh, yeah, but guys, wait, because we should start. Okay, let me... Okay, we should European. start together, right? You go to start. Yeah, so we have to start all together. And let me know. Uh, so you all download it. And this is, uh, you click to start the game. Wait. Start the game. And this is going to be pin. They're going to ask you for pin. Okay. So the link that I've sent to you for you to join me. Okay. Okay, we're here. If, if you can't, then it's okay. If it doesn't work, then you can just take a look on the. Yeah, but you can. Oh, Sylvia is here. Okay, I got you, Sylvia. Anyone else? <laughs> Sylvia is smart. She should tell us how to get in. Uh, yeah, Sylvia, you... only normal thing. Just, just use the first link. The uh, 
just the, the Kahoot uh, it. <laughs> and then you'll uh, you, you use the uh, the pin uh, the pin in the chat four four two six five nine six. Hello. Use it where, bro? Uh, it asks you when uh, when you use the first yes this link that Halawani sent. It asks you to write a pin. Yeah, so I I have Sylvia here. Ah, uh, okay. You guys are younger and smarter. Great. And let me. <laughs> okay, I will share my screen with you. I'm in. I think I'm in. Okay, perfect. <laughs> Yella, everyone else, where okay, are you guys? Here we are. Okay. okay, hello, Benny, Sylvia, Akira, anyone else? Yes, I'm here. I'm here. Anyone else? Yalla? Yalla, Bina. We have Sylvia, Halawani, and Kira. Yalla, Maria. Where's Maria? Are you sleeping, Maria? Uh, Maria is not here. Yet. Maria is sleeping. Taib, yalla, we will start. I'm here, doctor. I'm just trying to uh, log in. Tabial, Maria is trying to log in. خلاص يا ريري لقيناه. Please unmute yourself okay. and let us see what you do. Don't let me tell you to turn on your cameras. I don't want you to turn on your cameras for the internet. But if you don't answer quickly, I will let you turn on your cameras and see what you're doing, if you're staying or not. <laughs> That this is, is like a policeman. For our RAs, they should respect that. Ayua. <laughs> yeah, Lavina. Okay, we're here. I'm waiting for your instructions. Okay, so you should wait for Maria or? Maria, push you away. Huh? Maria, the last link on the chat, the shortest one, open it and enter the pin. I had the same problem. Just follow the last link on the chat and enter the pin and put your nickname or put your name and then you will appear on Navina's screen. Yep. Okay, are you following Maria? Oh, here she is. Here, yeah, love you. Hi. Okay, okay. Uh, guys, are you ready? Yes, we're ready, Navina. We're all in. Yeah, Lavina. Let's go. Let's go. I'm going to win this one. I'm very competitive. <laughs> yes, I am very, very competitive. I like to win. Okay, you have 20 seconds to answer. Okay. يلا ما شوف أنا حكسب حلواني وماريا ولا no where is بسانتي أريري okay which one should I start with you have to answer pick okay okay it's loading okay let's go to the second question okay Sylvia is leading now Sylvia is leading لا استنون مش كده so this is the question, and these are the one of potential answers. It's still loading for me. How come? I don't know. It says I'm on the podium, and it. طب خلاص incorrect ماشي طب طلعني بقى. Okay. Get me okay. out. Halawani and Maria. Do I, you... I thought I'd see the questions on the screen. What? We I can't see I... the questions on the screen. It on shows screen. only boxes. I have to look at your shared screen. Yes. Yeah, you have to look. I didn't know that. <laughs> oh, I didn't know that either. <laughs> That's why Sylvia is winning. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, do you want to start, start from start. the beginning? <laughs> <laughs> again, again, again. We love it. 
Okay, uh, but I I'm not quite sure if I end it, uh, if it's going to ask you to rejoin again. So let's just continue, okay? Okay, let's continue. <laughs> Yalla, we're winning okay, the guys. next one. Sylvia. Okay, the third the question. Amazon. We're going, okay. Where's the transaction capital perspective says? Ooh. Am I the classroom perfection or what? I don't even see, I'm not wearing my eyeglasses. <laughs> I, I don't see, I just chose one answer. Oh, correct. Great. Okay. I'm going to go, Yalla, next, next one. one, next one. Oh, Kira is winning or Sylvia. Yes. Okay. Yes, 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 yes. That's because I know the trick now. <laughs> Let's go now. Oh, my employees are not going to win me. No. Corporation <laughs> relation implies. Okay, more realistic understanding. Skedana implies. Mm, 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 mm. I want to see. Yeah. Uh, 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 uh. I'll choose this one, maybe. Well, I'm, I'm just choosing Kida. I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> oh, correct. <laughs> Great! <laughs> Seems like I, um, I know what I'm doing. Maria, Maria, how is it going? Uh, can you uh, okay, disconnect it? Oh, well, okay. please let her in when she's... Okay. I'm winning, I'm winning. Yalla, Silvia, yalla, where is um, the competitive spirit? Yeah, sorry guys, let me just uh, see where Maria is. Okay. Leave more competitors out, Nivina. I'm winning. Doctor, uh, Doctor yeah, you're, uh, you're the expert here. Yeah. No, 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 you should win as well. <laughs> I, I, I don't like competitions where I always well, win. I, I like choose, to win, I but I don't one. like it when I always win. I like I to do sometimes. <laughs> I chose one by mistake, so. Yeah. Rabi Allah Vina. Yalla again, Navina, I love it. We should do more of that. Let me see. I don't know participants. I'm going to give Navina more work. Uh, who is in the <laughs> I don't see uh in the waiting room anyone? Oh, we, we won't wait for her to reconnect. Maybe she has a problem with the... Ex mm, I cannot see anyone. Maybe she has a problem with the internet or something. Yeah, probably. So, okay, so let's just... Maybe continue. check with Maria, please. Okay. Uh, check where is she. Okay, but so... Basant didn't join. Basant is only consuming internet. She's okay. not here. <laughs> She's only consuming <laughs> extra next? data that she has. <laughs> okay, the, the, ready for the next question? Yeah, Lavina, we're ready, yes. Okay. Do you see it? You were faculty the state corporation, a new report. Uh, the first five days are to be seen too, my significant information is the previous, the superpowers are still richer than T and easy. Uh, okay. I guess I'm going to choose this one. Let's, oh no, I'm losing. Oh, Halloweeny is on the first. Halloweeny is now. on the first? Okay, okay, good Halloweeny, you were paying attention. He's okay. our smart guy. Okay. I wasn't paying attention Let's to go. that one actually. Yes. The yeah, next, question. next one. Okay, uh, PDS calls for, uh, I guess I'm going to choose this one. Military intervention. <laughs> Military intervention? Oh, I didn't expect that. I wasn't paying attention, I'm sorry. Okay, <laughs> okay. I will let my guys win for now. <laughs> Maria, you have the same link on the chat. Maria, you have the link on the chat. The last link so, on the yes, chat. Yes, just to clarify, guys, it's economic. It's just economic measures. So I was going to teacher. choose that. Economic, yes. <laughs> okay. Just economic measures. 
Okay, okay. Um, Maria, so now <laughs> we're on the sixth question, but like if you want to um, uh, go for it, it's an interesting game, so maybe you can join. She doesn't hear me. Maria joined the last, she's going to join Navina. Yala, go to the next <laughs> question. Okay. Okay, <laughs> sorry, so. <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I want to be the first. Okay. Where, eh, where the anti bicot legislative has taken place? Uh, I would say this. What? Incorrect again. It's not the EU? Of course it's, it's not the, the UK. It's the US. The US. Oh, yes. Okay, great. I love Americans. Okay, great. <laughs> but no, anti, anti, again. this is no. anti. Yes. <laughs> no, they are winning. Okay, no, let's go. Losing. Yeah, I need Are the NTPES Incorrect again. Idaba. <laughs> <laughs> Now I mean, no, I should win. Okay, I'm winning. No. Did, did you study economy or something related to? Hello, when he yes, studied economy, he's our economic economic guru. He's yeah, that's why. About behavioral why. economics now in Egypt, and he's going to run an initiative and so on. That's why he's so into. Uh, and he was, paying attention. he was paying attention. He was paying attention. I paid attention, that's it. Ah. <laughs> okay, yeah. Thank you, Halawani, for making us look stupid. Yalla. Okay, next question. Let's <laughs> go next question. One of the of the last ones. Take public rooms in. Okay, so should... yes, I'm going to win this one. <laughs> if I don't win it, I'm out of this game. <laughs> I'm very competitive. <laughs> As I can yeah. see, you're confusing them. Yes. By talking. <laughs> That's what I always did in class. Oh, incorrect again. We believe in you. No, I don't believe in myself anymore. It's not social issues. Hello, Annie, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> I think that you're fired after this. Oh, it's, okay. This is the problem I was talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go. Yalla, Bin. Again. The last one. Who's going to be responsible for being a user from a certain market? Ah, I don't know this one. I wasn't paying attention. Unilever. <laughs> we will see. I hope it's correct. Hello, any if you win this game, Hadi Oh. Okay. Okay, I lost again. Who is I'm the winner? Hello, Yeah, that's right. I'm third. Hello, Annie. Hello, Annie. We owe Hello, Annie 500 pounds. Yeah, doctor, Hello, Annie. 500 Egyptian pounds for Hello, Annie for making us look good. <laughs> okay. So, okay. Uh, did you like the uh, game? I loved it. We need more of, of it. Okay, that, that's perfect then. <laughs> I'm glad that you like it. We love the uh, game. We love the fact that it's online. We love the fact that it's very smart, very easy, very fast. You're very professional, Navina. Thank you very much. Please proceed. Okay, thank you, guys. So uh, this will be the end. And I can only ask for your questions if you have them. Um, so I won't be keeping you more. There is a case study I wanted you to do, but like there is no point of researching. You can do it as a homework, let's we say. We can do it as a homework till next time. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, you already have a lot of homework. But... Yes, yes. I love homeworks and I love studying <laughs> and I need to rock this quiz next time. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so if you have any questions, so please text me. You have my number and info for you or you want to learn more about it or you need a literature. I didn't write references here. Sorry for that. But if you need anything, uh, just just ask me and I'll forward you. So yeah, that's it. Any questions? Anyone has any question, guys? Would you please drop us the case study to 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 
catch up or to maybe apply what we learned today on today's workshop on the group, please, Nivina. And it would be uh, like an assignment for everyone. It would be yeah, good they can... <laughs> the review you do of your workshop, and it would be good for us to apply what we've learned with you today. Okay, so yeah, definitely, I'm gonna send you uh, Huawei US case study and questions that I want to ask you. So you answer me, and once you answer, it can be just one sentence, two sentences for each question, and send it to me then. Great. I'll send everything in a group. Great, great. Thank you so much, Nivina. Anyone has a question? Okay, Nivina, I will let you go relax, take your lunch, and then we should speak again today to finish everything that's uh, binding between us. Okay. Um, okay, deal. Yeah. So Whenever I thank you guys for, for listening me. I'll send you a Zoom link. Okay. So thank you for listening to me and thank you for playing this game. So thank you. Be... It's been so exciting. <laughs> thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye, honey. Thank you so much.